Greetings, nerds. This is Cena Nerd. I'm your host, Sarah Belmont, and with me as always is our Mr. Producer, Will Paul. How are you doing tonight, Will? Oh, I'm doing well, Sarah. I just uh, enjoyed the pre-show, getting some great outtake material to just drop in <laughs> sometime. <laughs> After you were scolded for not recording the pre-show, I know, suddenly I know. And then get, yeah, <laughs> and, and also just getting tossed under the bus about uh, just trying to suggest some topics to talk about tonight. But you know, you know, we'll just you know, uh, you know, it's all good. It's all good. Okay, and after all of that shade, how, how are you doing tonight? <laughs> I am doing good. I I don't know what to expect tonight. Okay. Uh, we have Patricia with us tonight again. Hey, Patricia. Please acknowledge Hi. listeners. <laughs> Hello, listeners. I'm melting in Washington because I'm actually in Alaska. Oh, you should just come down to North Carolina. Uh, no, thanks. I'm good. <laughs> I, I really don't think that they accept us down there. <laughs> yeah, we, we would accept you. I don't know how long you would last with the, you know, with the heat that we've had the last uh, couple of days, but uh, come on down. Yeah. I I I think I would be a puddle in the airport. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't mix with heat at all. At no, it's, all. it's only 80 degrees here, and I know that's, like, nothing to write home about, but that's, like, I'm, I'm literally dying today. Oh, boy. Just <laughs> you saying 80 degrees, like, it's 80 degrees outside makes me feel hot. Oh, dude, that's great. Right? That's, that's balmy. <laughs> <laughs> balmy? <laughs> That's just balmy. That's just balmy. Right. Okay. Well, I've been told by our producer that we have to start tonight's show <laughs> <laughs> with talking about still images. And for those of you who don't know, <laughs> sorry, guys, this was a whole thing during the pre-show about explaining what still images are and if we care about them or not. And Will cares. Will cares deeply and passionately about still images because both Aquaman and Wonder Woman 2 released images this past week. And I just took, like, all I could see was Chris Pine, Chris Pine and his blue eyes. Like, that's it. That's what the second movie will be about, right? Exactly. Exactly. That's all, okay. that's all, that's, that's all we need to know is Chris Pine and his, and his blue eyes. Yeah. So, so okay, but, how is he coming back? Because I know you've both seen Wonder Woman. Yep. Uh, so, who, is he another version of the Winter Soldier? Like, is he, oh. are they going to point out what happened with the TV show and how Steve Trevor, like, his descendant? What do you guys think is going on? Oh, so you're, so it could be a Captain America scenario. Not necessarily Winter I, I heard that over this week, and I'm like, you know, that would sh- – yeah, and, and what I liked about that theory was that um, in the second – in this movie, instead of her, Diana, being a fish out of water, it's Steve being a fish out of water. And I was like, that that's perfect. That's exactly what they should do. They sh- and I'm going to be very disappointed when they don't do that. Yeah, I think <laughs> – Because it's DC. <laughs> Yeah, it, it is DC, but uh, but it's handled it's you know again in the capable hands of Patty Jenkins, and I think I hope she does go with the Captain America or uh, version of how he comes back. Um, we of course, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen Wonder Woman, uh, just pause, just fast forward to our cloak and dagger discussion here shortly. But with uh, you know he, the plane blew up. But it's sort of like when Captain America crashed and, you know, the first Avenger, we, you know, we saw the crash and stuff, but there, with these, with these films, there's always an escape hatch. And I think Steve possibly took advantage of that in some form. Yeah. And I, I, we were talking about this before. I truly don't think that the second movie would be as successful if they didn't have Chris Pine because him and Gals, chemistry just made that movie so much more for me at least mm-hmm. and and it, you can't fault him for what happened in the third act so he's like clean from the, the first movie and he can help restore balance 
I don't know. Patricia, what are your thoughts? <laughs> well, I have not seen the still that you guys are talking about. So I, and I don't know what picture we're talking about, but I literally have like <laughs> no feelings about whether he's in the movie or not. Like, it's great that he's going to be in the movie, but I think that, or that, <laughs> well, I'll pick, you know, I'm a little, how oh, they're going to bring him back. Like, why doesn't anybody ever stay dead? Just die. <laughs> like, I know that's like not the best character to be talking about. Dark, dark, yeah. dark Patricia, dark. Well, I'll paint the picture for you. So <laughs> basically it's, it looks like Steve is in the middle of a shopping mall. And he's got he wearing a members only jacket and he's off looking looking off in the distance. And it would and we also get a we also get a step well, I mean that's you know, he, he's rocking the members only jacket. It's nineteen eighty four. Okay. Explain Wait. the other explain the other still, because this is just genius. Keep going. Yeah, so Keep going. the uh there's the second one that was dropped uh or midweek is uh Wonder Woman in a uh in the, uh, apparently in the same mall, but it's you know just like, or maybe she's in a circuit, maybe she's in a circuit city because there's like there's like the, all these TVs and she's looking at them and then like on one of the television sets that has the TV show Dallas and has you know J.R. Ewing like in the corners uh, TV set and stuff and then you know has the sign off with the you know the rainbow uh, bars on, on the TV set and and, and a few other other you know, time relevant relevant to screen and then i guess yesterday we got uh, a picture of gal in the uh, wonder woman costume and and she was also in that mall again but only this time she was in the wonder woman costume because apparently wonder woman 84 doesn't take place outside of this mall. so far <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I, I i think um it could be a dream sequence too <laughs> No, I don't, I don't think it is. I, and I, I think that, um, I would have actually, like, like I said before, I would have personally been shocked if they hadn't brought him back just because of what happened on, I believe, the TV show where they, they had an actor in the original, um, season play Steve Trevor, then he gets killed and then she ends up on Earth and she encounters um the same actor but he's playing a descendant of steve trevor so it's like this this big thing and so i i kind of i like when as long as the as long as the script is is sticking to like part of that history i can appreciate it and it just doesn't feel like what happens in the arrowverse where they kill people for stakes and then they bring them back even though Sarah did not approve of that, Ralph. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, like, or they drop in a really cool character, tease you with him for two episodes, and then he disappears, and you're like, that's a shame, only for them to announce before the third season is even over that, hey, this character will be a series regular moving forward, and you're kind of like, I'm sorry, I even forgot that the third season was still going on. So <laughs> I'm that's Supergirl. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> you guys are really not helping me. No, right you now. Were, can, you, can we get some? You were like on a good rant there about the uh, about Brainiac, so I, you know, Brainy Five. So I'm like, okay, hey, roll with it. <laughs> I'm not going to interrupt a good rant. I just don't understand oh. anymore. <laughs> Go ahead. I just. So I just looked up the stills and, you know, that you guys, that Will graciously described. They're totally different than what you described, by the way. I had a totally different picture in my head. <laughs> so I'm glad I looked it up. Um, but so what, so um, when did the first movie take place? Like what time? Was that Civil War? No, it was, uh, no, it was that. No, no, no. no. The war, first, the first, first World War. First World. Okay. So, uh, we were in England. I know. I was, that's, I was talking about like real world war. So, going back to what I think happens. Yeah. I don't know. Never mind. My no, idea. I really can't. No, oh, no, please, please. What, what you think happens. I think they time travel. 
I think that Wonder Woman goes back in time to save Steve from the plane, and then they end up going in time forward to 84, and then they get stuck there, and that's what this movie's about. But this is coming from a person that has not seen any trailers. This is the first time she's seen stills and knows nothing about the comics. And yeah. well, so well, that's fine. There's no trailers. They just started say, filming. So. And, okay, well. And I will say that for somebody who just laid out that disclaimer, you probably did put out, like, exactly what's going to happen because I still don't trust DC like Will does. And so hey. they could do that. <laughs> really? <laughs> 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 For all I know. <laughs> that's a bit. That's a bit much to say. I trust DC. I I, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what would you call it, Will? I have cautious optimism. Cautious. <laughs> Such a dad thing to say. <laughs> Happy Father's Day, by thank, the way. Thank. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah. So, so, so what other, ha- oh, Aquaman. Yeah. Patricia, the, these are more stills. Actually, actually, Will, I'm dying for you to describe at least one of the stills of Aquaman to Patricia. Oh, uh, that's a good way to, I will describe, <laughs> I'm going to describe the still of White Manta because we know what Aquaman has looked like. For, um, you know, just from Justice League and everything else. So I think we got our first look at, at, uh, of Black Manta and he was, uh, it's basically, I don't, I don't know, if, Patricia, are you familiar with Black Manta at all from like Super Friends or anything? Uh-huh. Okay. So basically, yeah, so that's. <laughs> So, can you imagine if she was like, "Oh yeah, we go way yeah. back." I, 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 you know, I don't, I didn't want to, I didn't want to, you know, comic explain or anything like that. So, you know, or Saturday morning TV explain. So, the Black Manta is is one of Aquaman's villains, and uh, so there's a picture of the actor. I guess it, it looks like he's in a lab, and he has the the Black Manta hood, which or mask, which is basically like those old. Think of like the old like dive suits with the big you know, bell um, helmet, and so it's a more modern version of that. Uh, and so I was like, oh, let's look. I was wondering how they were going to, you know, have Black Manta uh, look in, in the movie, and I, I was, I, I was, I approve of DC doing something right for a change. Did you find the photos? No, yeah. I've been finding all photos, so it's just of you know Aquaman and his uh, trident and yeah. being shirtless, yeah, well, and yeah, things. And now I feel like a weirdo because I'm, <laughs> I'm just like, oh, this is all shirtless. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Uh, yeah, that's why I didn't just describe any of Aquaman because they're they're pretty much all the same. So, what did um, what did you think of Nicole Kidman and Amber Heard? I like Nicole Kidman. I mean. She, I, I was like, damn, she's a, such a chameleon. But um, uh, but I, I really liked her, uh, uh, the photo that I did see of her um, in, in the Entertainment Weekly piece. I don't, I don't know what to think at this point about Aquaman. Uh, um, I think it's really strange that it's coming up in October still. Yeah. And until I see a trailer or maybe even two, I, I, I don't know how this is going to get pulled yeah. off. Well, so, we'll I guess we'll get our first trailer at uh, San Diego Comic Con. Absolutely, yeah. I just I feel like the the EW spread everything is still very shiny, um, which ma- gives me the impression of fake. <laughs> <laughs> and I understand this is a fake. I I get it, guys. It's not real, but um, it it takes me out. Like it reminds me that all of this stuff is sets and um everything is like an illusion and. And when I go see something, I usually want to be, I want to escape into whatever story is being told. So hopefully it's not all glossy and new. I, I like sets that are worn in. Like Star Wars usually gets a lot of praise for that, for having a very lived in environment. Um, so, so I, I'm interested to see. I'm also interested to see how much reliance on CGI there will yeah. be. 
um, because we've seen that work at work before and be pulled off very well recently. And we've also seen it blow up in people's faces uh, for not doing good. So so it's, it'll be interesting. And then I hope James Wan can make a splash. See what I did oh. there? Yep. Mm-hmm. Nailed it. Huh. <laughs> And with that, we'll, we will stop talking about, um, images that are in still motion and start talking about live action. Let's do it. Let's right? do it. Yeah. Let's, do, let's talk about some okay. live action stuff. Okay. Cloak and Dagger, episode three, Stained Glass. Oh, this is such a good show. Such a good it show. Really is. So, so Patricia, what are, what are your first thoughts on the third episode of Cloak and Dagger? I both liked it and hated it. Uh, okay, that's enough, Patricia. <laughs> <All right. laughs> no, I was just like, I love the fact that he got to go, like, you know, you get to see New Orleans on her little voodoo tour thing. I don't know what that character's name is. Avida. 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 Well, when she gave her little tour, like, that was really cool. And that was pretty straightforward. Literally everything else was like, is this a vision? Is this not a vision? What's happening? Like, I was mostly just confused, and I couldn't stop watching it because it was, like, well done, and I want to know more. But at the same time, I'm like, why the heck am I watching this? Because I don't understand what's going on until they get to the end, and they were, like, in person, like, we need to talk. And then it ended, and I was like, Crap! <laughs> now I need to wait for episode four. So. Wait, 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 wait. Like, like, please, let's go back. You just gave, like, the, the most disgusted version of well done I've ever yeah. heard anybody deliver. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's like, I would It was well done. Yeah, if you, yeah. <laughs> if you hated it. It was like, uh, only, yeah, it was like you, you, you ordered a piece of steak and you wanted it like medium rare and you're like, well, this is well known. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just meant like the filming and the transitions and everything was like pretty smooth, but where the characters were at and why they kept repeating like in the dreams, like that, I just don't worry. Like, like I said, I both loved it and I hated it because. It was like cool. Filming's great. Everything's like technically like great with it, but what happened? It's okay. <laughs> we're we're here. Will and I will break it down for you because <laughs> I I am actually surprised. You're not the first person to tell me that they got confused in this yeah. episode and me I'm just like I, I thought it was kind of straightforward. Yeah. I I I get that there are some narration changes that occur, um but I also looked into Cloak and Dagger last week, and so I think that's what allowed me to not get so lost in the puzzles. Uh, but before we go there, uh, Will, what are your initial thoughts about this third episode? Initial thoughts. So I thoroughly enjoyed it. My new – it's definitely – one. Of, it's, it's interesting to hear Patricia's uh, take on it because I could see where she's – coming from on her um, I, I, I mixed feelings because it, it's it's one of those episodes that, you know, coming out the, the first two, it was definitely a change of pace because we had so much frenetic energy and action going on in the, in the first two. And then this one, it starts out from the moment at the beginning of the episode where you know, the car is wrecked. Um, it's t- told from Tandy's perspective. And then, of course, you get it to Ty- Tyrone's perspective later. Taking it, you know, taking it as a whole, this episode is one where if if you were, like, binge watching, then you could, you know, the way it stopped, and then you could go to the next one. Then you feel, I think, okay with that because you, could, you get your answer, like, one minute later versus one week later. But I just thoroughly enjoyed just how they just they just structured this episode and basically told the same event that happened to them with the with the with Tandy running off the road and that's our own shooting a gun and you know use that as a springboard for both of them to you know, share their perspectives on uh, 
two critical you know situations in their in their life and and just how they you know again brought all those little points back together from the you know, Tandy seeing Tyrone playing basketball and having dealing with it through his guilt with about Billy Tyrone helping her you know both of them having that same epiphany that if you keep doing the same thing over and over again you're gonna get the same result and I thought that was like very the way they structured the story and when they both made that moment of recognition of that that point it, it that whole, it really brought made Total episode makes sense. Yeah, I, I think um, I think it was interesting how that epiphany occurred when they were on somebody else's journey, mm-hmm. as Tyrone puts it at the end of the episode, that it wasn't they both found themselves in these situations where they ended up experiencing a subconscious truth um, in each mm-hmm. other and and something that that ne- nobody else will know about it like that's why i feel bad for tyrone's girlfriend now her they haven't made it official but i'm going to assume that they're dating now um because because he she pushed him to go on this journey and he comes out and he's just experienced something very intimate um and which will connect him to tandy that much more because those those really, I love what they did with the visions mm-hmm. because they first had the hopes play out and then the fears play out um, in each sequences. And I actually have a full page of notes that I've dubbed dream notes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> please, please elaborate. <laughs> few things to point out uh, because I'm sure Will has all of this stuff about like the the nuances of the what was portrayed on the screen. But I want to talk about just like in structure of the contrast between the sequences. I thought it was really fascinating how all of Tandy's experience with little Tyrone was shot in daytime. And all of Tyrone's experiences with little Tandy was shot at night, except for you could argue the church scene. Um, But that's debatable because we don't know they're in a closed space. And and so, again, you have that light and dark and the fact that they are in in a weird way, or at least the way my mind puts it in each other's subconscious. And she's she's dagger and he's cloak and light and dark. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so so I really like that. I really like how he wakes up in his in his house. Nobody's around. But Tandy's kind of taken over a little bit because he looks on the walls. So the portraits are out. The family portraits are all gone. And instead there's these chalk drawings. And I think that's probably going to come up later on this season about why there were those drawings, whether it was drawings she did as a kid, whether it's something that she connects with her father. But I, I think that is an Easter egg of some sort. And I like how he wakes up on the roof again with Roxanne Corp. Like something that Tandy has yet to figure out about this yeah. is how much of an impact her father's job had on what's going, what she and Tyrone are going through right now. And until she makes that connection, she isn't going to ever find peace, peace. And I think that's why they did it. And that moment that I had to get on Twitter um, the other day and be like, this show is genius was when he sees that the power line is going to electrocute electrocute little Tandy Mm -hmm. and jumps in the safe. Like that's a reenactment of the pilot episode. Only like he is actively saving her and she wanted to self-sacrifice her. Like that's something so dark about her hope. Her hope was that she died in the accident and not her dad. Like she wanted to be the one who Mm -hmm. died. And and she she has to figure out that she survived and she can't like go back there like stop doing the same thing. I thought that was beautiful. Oh man, yeah. um, what else could I say? Yeah, I think I think it's it was really just powerful what they what they did and with Tyrone's sequences. My God, yeah, those dreams 
Ooh, those hopes and dreams and the fact that he, he wanted his brother to ditch his friends and stay with him. And then my last note about Tyrone Will, and then I'll let you go at it, is that is that when I first didn't get the checks yeah. until I realized, like, until the first, the second one appeared, and then they, he, she finds little Tyrone um, at the place where you cash in mm-hmm. checks, and he has yet to cash in any exactly. of them. And that's because, like, this is debt. This is debt piled up for years and years of living without his brother. Yep. Oh, yeah, and I, I'm glad yeah. you brought the checks up because I was going to, I was hoping you would or Patricia would because especially with the checks in the moment when he gets his vengeance on Officer uh, Collins, Detective Col- um, Collins, and yep. the blood, you have the blood soaked checks, and then the and then mm-hmm. the but instead of you know instead of feeling like being free and vindicating, not only does he have the blood of this man on his hands now, but also, and also Billy again, but also he was his parents. It was very, that moment when his parents like fell prior to the, the police coming to, to arrest him. That, that moment was just to me, just very, you know, very telling because Tyrone was hoping that he, you know, by doing this, he's free and everything's hopefully cashing in on, this emotional debt and, and burden that he's, he's held for all these years, but instead he, he lost even more, uh, and, and, and doing that, doing that act. And he, you know, he loses his parents, he loses, you know, you know his life a, as well with yeah. the, uh, being lynched. And, you know, and, and maybe that was just metaphorically losing his life. I don't think, you know, but, um, it, it was just a very, you know, very painful. You know, the, the, you know, good use of just emotional pain. And then, all, you know, I was thinking back with Tandy and one of the things mm-hmm. that, uh, they did a very, it was a very subtle thing, but it was also very noticeable as well. Um, and I don't know, that doesn't make sense, but here we're <laughs> going with this, with her concussion and the ringing yeah. in the background because uh-huh. it, uh, it really, it was almost where they had this ringing and it was her being addled from the car accident, you know, triggering again the, these feelings that she's, she's had, um, you know, of guilt with her father and, and also just, you know, running. But even though she's running, she still ends up, you know, turning around and, and going back to her mother. Yeah. I thought that was, that was, for Tandy, it was, it was cool to see. I felt like Tyrone's progression because they had all of the different weapons laid out on the table. Like you could tell he, every time he comes back, he's going to pick up a new weapon. But with Tandy, you weren't really sure how it was going to change, um, whenever she returned. So it was cool to see it start out with her on the outside looking in and seeing her dad get basically waterboarded. Yeah. And then they, the next scene plays out only this time her mom's in the room yelling and like that even freaks her out. And then she as a girl is in the room too, trying to make it stop. And there's like this helpless, like I think I, and then Tyrone had some interesting responses to Tandy, like, like telling her, like, can't you see what's in her face? And, and I'm just like, but she's a little girl. girl at this moment. Like, how do you? G- kids shouldn't take care of parents, right. and and I think that's really what they're getting at between her relationship with her parents was like she was forced to become an adult at a really young mm-hmm. age, and that has caused a lot of tor- turmoil in her. So so, but I still didn't really understand what he expected her to do, like. Well. For for the first part of his visions with her in it, she was a little girl. And then after she almost got electrocuted, she was a teenager or whatever mm-hmm. age. So she was a little bit present day. older. Yeah, more present day than just little girl. Well, it was a, there was a present day, but there was still the intervening tweener years where she was handing out the bills to all the men and Tandy's life. 
Yeah. That, that scene. Oh my God. Yeah. Like, their religious context and just these, these men who are willing to go to her, who, who praise her and, and she in return gives them death and curses them and all of this. Like, I thought that was so cool because that's what she did in the first episode. The first episode, I forget his name, but she ends up breaking his Mm -hmm. heart. And and she does not feel like she deserves love from any man because of what happened with her dad. Just like Tyrone doesn't feel like he deserves any sense of happiness because of the sacrifice of his brother. Like the guilt yeah. of that. But uh, but it's interesting though with the we did see in that sequence though one of the uh, the guy who tried to rape her though. Yeah. And, and and the boy she she um she had she broke yeah. up with at the end right of the first right so I don't know yeah so I'm, I'm just curious to see you know all those different people I, I guess you're, to your larger point she just doesn't you know any kind of familial or relationship with any male figure is just doomed for doomed to death because of what happened to her father because I mean despite everything that happened with you know, whatever things that she had to step up and, and, and be that parent because her mother was, you know, had her issues. I mean, I think her father definitely was, you know, was somewhat of a stabilizing force in her life and that was just, you know, taken away. So, right. so I, so I, I guess that sequence in the church is again another way of just showing how Tandy, you know, just fears being very close to anyone because um, either it'll get taken away from her or they will be unreliable like her mother. Even though her mother did, even though yeah. her mother did step up and did the right thing this time with, you know, with dealing with the technical rally. Right, right. Um, did, to go back to your point about the, the ringing and the, um, Tandy's concussion, I, I'm kind of split on this. Like, I think that they did a very good job with trying to make it seem like Tandy goes through this because of the head injury as a result of the car accident. But um I would also like to add in there, very, and comics explain, that um in the comics, apparently, if Tandy doesn't use her powers, she will have visions mm-hmm. and go a little bit crazy. So I don't know if they were blending it um, and trying to do both simultaneously, but you it's know, possible. I I think I think it could be explained because the the end result is that her whatever is inside of her that is connected to Tyrone is basically saying you can't leave New Orleans. Mm-hmm. Stop trying to. Yeah. yeah. Because Tyrone's yeah, here. Well, I mean, that was, I mean, she was because she got on the bus. The bus was, again, was going to take her out of town. What did she have? What happened on the yeah. bus? She had a vision of young Tyrone. Yeah. And what happened at the very beginning of this episode? She, she, Tyrone shows up right where she's about to leave town and ends up basically stopping her, causing the car yeah. wreck. So I, I'm surprised that neither one of them picked up on that. Like, hey, I keep showing up whenever you're trying to lo- get out of town. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, Just yeah, maybe, maybe it'll, it'll. Well, I like that they are. You know, I think we'll finally get to some of that in episode four uh, next week. Uh, but it, it, but I've, I've, I've been appreciating the the, the slow build up. It, it's, it's, it's been nice to have them work. To that, to that, to their relationship and, and, and also just some of the visuals. Cause so even like whenever they were at that in the, in the swamp where, uh, Tandy saw, you know, the people waterboarding you know, her dad, one of the little, mm-hmm. you know, both of them manifested their powers and, and trying to explain to each other, keep doing the same thing over and over again, you get the same result. With Tandy, it was when her dagger showed up when Tyrone uh, was about to kill the, 
the cop in his vision. In that vision. Mm -hmm. With him, I didn't notice it the first time, but when I was watching it today, I noticed that his cloak actually like yep. embraced her when they were in the, mm -hmm. in the, in the swamp. And again, just, you know, again, reinforcing that connection between the two of them. Yeah. I, um, I find it to be so refreshing that the, going into the show, you think like instantly they're going to have already known each other. They're going to have a history or they're going to meet and suddenly forced to become partners. But the way that the show is doing it is it's first defining them as separate characters um, with separate issues, separate, separate stories to tell, and then just creating the opportunities for yeah. them to find the answers that they're both looking for when their paths yeah. cross, um, because they are so linked yeah. to one another. Um, and they just haven't figured that out yet. Just like we haven't figured out why outside of what we've been shown and what they can remember from that night. But there's still that mystery about why exactly um, this has occurred and what what's truly going on with them. And and also it's like a lot of shows, they do this where you have two leads and that first season is built off builds a relationship around pure attraction to one another. And that's not what's happening here. It's, it's much more about them learning about each other through these very comic book like scenarios. And, and then they're going to like, that's how the bond is forming. And so, so when we get the relationship in season three, <laughs> it'll be worth yeah, it. Yeah. Patricia, have we helped <laughs> yeah. you feel less, Conflicted about this episode. I, I know we haven't. I know we've been like sort of going at out of here with each other for a bit. But I I, I want to get your uh, your thoughts before we close out on our discussion on this. Yeah. No. I think you guys explained everything really well. And there's little things that you guys have explained, like about the checks. Like I was so confused about the checks because I thought that like in the very first episode, like his brother gave him a check or something but now i understand the whole debt thing and that like there's just so much that sort of cleared up like i was the confused one and you guys just explained everything beautifully yes. and so job right. well accomplished let's talk about auntie Chantel because she's yeah. the big question mark i have she's a new character avita introduces her to tyrone and another part about this episode that caused it to feel very unstructured is that from the first scene to a gap in the middle to the last scene, you're being shown a 3D printer that's out of focus. And also, word to the wise, showrunner, Sarah does not like watching scenes out of focus. It drives me crazy. <laughs> really, I get what you're going for, but it really bothered me. It gave me a headache. <laughs> But you start to see this figure, and then you start to figure out it's Tyrone. Um, and at the end, it's it was Auntie Chantel the whole mm -hmm. time. And she made, dare I say it, a voodoo doll of Tyrone and put it on her mantle. What I don't get is... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, okay, so they, they showed a view like towards the very, very end of all of her other voodoo mm -hmm. dolls. Mm -hmm. And they were all handmade from organic materials and things like that. And then all of a sudden, for some reason, she decided to use a 3D printer to print out Tyrone's mm -hmm. voodoo me, doll. Pick me, pick me, pick me, pick me. Uh, Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Um, Go. I got it. I got it. I know, I know, because I cheated and I watched um, an interview with the showrunner and he basically explained that the reason why they did a 3D printer is because in the first scene where you meet Auntie Chantel, she's on her laptop. So this woman is tech savvy. And why would someone in this day and age use materials that were used in the past to create yeah. Like you want to you want to use technology of today, um, especially to give off resemblance of who the person is, because that's what a voodoo doll is supposed to do. It's supposed to give off resemblance of that that individual. 
And also she, there is a line of dialogue that explains that th- those dolls on her mantle have been, are older than, than like the town yeah, or yeah. something like those. She didn't make right, all of those. Right. Those are historic. Right. historic. So, That's so I get your wrong. point, but you also missed one other interesting fact about the voodoo dolls on her mantle. They're pairs. They're all in yeah, pairs. Yep. Both, 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 pairs. Yep. Uh, yep, take it from yeah, here, Will. So, yeah, they are in pairs, and uh, I, I don't have much more to add to that other than I noticed, again, that was the uh, thing. I, I didn't catch it the first time I watched the episode, but I noticed it today. They are in pairs, and so another thing that I didn't, I meant to bring up earlier, and it relates to Tandy's concussion. Remember, Chantil said we could do it one of two ways as far as helping Tyrone do his visions. <sighs> You're so right. She said we could club you over the head <laughs> and call, give you a concussion to help you see the vision, or you can get, you know, you can use this stuff and take us, you know, take a bath. So. This is me clapping, like, slow clap for real. <laughs> <laughs> just nailed it. My God, I can't believe I missed that. That is so So, true. you know, so it relates. Why did you go, let me go on all my tangents about what I thought the concussion is? And here you are laying well, out it, facts. It, <laughs> just, it, it's just, it was just, it, it's the context. Cause we're talking about Auntie Chantel. <laughs> and it just, it, I had a note about it earlier and then I just, I remembered, I was like, oh yeah, it's just from my note. But anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, so I think to your point, Sarah, though, it does blend the old and the new because Instead of, because Tyrone was like, oh, we gotta go, go foraging in the forest for this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's like, no, just go the whole paycheck. And you can get all the things you need. So, you know, again, that is another point where, you know, she is blending this ancient, you know, magical religion and with, with present day, uh, like she is now clearly with the 3D printer and, and Tyrone and the Voodoo doll. So it's just only a matter of time before she will, uh, you know, make the pair with, Handy. Yeah. Well, it, with the voodoo dolls being in pairs, like I know that anybody can make voodoo dolls for anybody or mm-hmm. however. I don't know anything about voodoo practices, but I'm assuming that you can. Um, my question is, is do the pairings and the fact that they are older than the town itself indicate that there are previous pairs of cloak and dagger that have gone to the same you know, family of voodoo shamans. Right. Is that is that like a thing? That is a legitimate theory that is out there right now. Yes. Okay. Cool. I <laughs> contributed. <laughs> you know what you're going on. See, it's very clear. It's very on. clear. Well. I, yeah, but but I, I mean, I still like the fact that I didn't catch up on that catch that line of dialogue will like just proves that you can catch so many things in mm-hmm. this show and still be be like, oh, I didn't because when I was rewatching the episode, I'm like, why didn't I notice that 3D printer right in the background when you first walk into her apartment? It's there, right yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Man, I and then I was too focused on the fact that she laid down the Joker card, which in both the fears right. and hope position, which, which again, like at the end of the day, I think I really like this episode so much because of how it took that duality that really attracted a lot of us to the story in the first two episodes yeah. and just expanded on it so much more and, and in such a unique yeah. way. Well, I, I know this, this, I had a couple people DM me on Twitter about the show, and you know, they the first they weren't so sold after with the first two episodes, but then they watched this one and they wrote that they love it now because of I think it's the, the very mature way of storytelling that uh, that this, this particular episode uh, put out there. Yeah, yeah, it is not something you see in the Arrowverse. No, that's for sure. no. I think. Part of my confusion was if maybe I watched the episode an actual second time, that probably would have been a smart idea, not just watching it once. I would probably would have caught up on, like, more things. Um, but 
I think I I still feel like I'm the opposite. Like I watched the first two episodes and I'm like, yeah. And this one is sort of like, yeah. Oh, okay. oh, I get it. I get it. You know. Yeah. I, but after like talking everything through and saying like the episode itself had so much emotion with it without being emotional. Mm-hmm. Is that? And that's. I mean, I'm still going to watch the show. It's not going to turn me off that much. But you're right, Will. It's one of those ones, like, if Netflix had dropped the whole season, this would be the episode that I would probably could have done without. Because they could have just said, okay, they're connected. Like, I'm so used to things being right in your face that this storytelling was sort of on the next level. Whereas you and Sarah are, like, into it. And Sarah... You get you just pull so much out and I'm like whoa and then I'm mind blown and I have nothing to say but you know yeah I think I also had the advantage of watching three seasons of the affair and they do so much with perspective and narrative storytelling that to me I'm like this is a breeze <laughs> <laughs> I get it <laughs> yeah but the affair is back guys it's on showtime good show yeah mm-hmm Okay, that's my Showtime plug. <laughs> Apparently, all you, I do is plug Showtime, Showtime these days. Show yeah, got, but yeah, billions. Now the fair. Let's see what else. Uh. <laughs> all right. Well, that's it for Cloak and Dagger tonight. Uh, now on to things that Patricia is aware about because she wanted to talk about these things. Let's talk some Netflix. Woo! Yeah. Stupid shows that are very straightforward and nothing is left unturned. Um, (laughs) (laughs) The Kissing Booth. I liked the movie a lot. And you said you watched it, right, Sarah? I've seen both of these. Um, Both of these original movies. I'm going to sit back and enjoy it and grab a box of popcorn and just enjoy the discussion. (laughs) So... The first one is The Kissing Booth, and the Mm -hmm. second one is Set It Up. Set It Up was just released a couple days ago, I'm assuming, because it popped up on my feed. Um, The Kissing Booth, I thought it was going to be really dumb, like a stupid high school movie, but then I watched the trailer. You know, Netflix automatically plays the trailers now. And I was like, well, this could be a little bit more depthful. Um and then I watched it, and I, of course, was, like, being all emotional and cried. I actually cried. Um, so you can make <laughs> – feel free to make fun of me, Sarah. Oh, Patricia. Pause. So, <laughs> I, I did not cry. Um, I I ended up watching the case thing booth because I was – I just kept seeing it on my Twitter feed – like people hashtagging it or whatnot. And it just, I felt like the world was telling me, Sarah, it'll be really beneficial in the future if you sit down and watch this movie because Patricia is going to watch it. And so I did. I I hated it. Um, My my big thing is that the guy looks so much older than her that it really was creepy. Like I'm usually not one to notice that kind of thing when like, People who are in their early 20s are playing high school, high schoolers, and it's obvious. And this is the first time when it was really obvious to me. And then it even freaks me out more because they're dating in real life. And I'm like, how does this work? <laughs> Dad, I did not have any intro it on Twitter. I didn't see it anywhere. It just popped up on my Netflix and I was like one night, okay, cool. Let's watch this. Um, I did not know that they were dating in real life. Mm hmm. That is no, you're right. The age thing, like you can tell that he is not in high school, no. and that's really hard. But in fact, a lot of the players on that football team did not look like they should be in high school. <laughs> no, in <laughs> most in most high school films, like the people that they show in locker rooms and stuff, it's like. That is not a high school. <laughs> I don't know what high school you went to, but that sure is crap wasn't mine. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, no, that's very true. I thought the story. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, like, the other thing that really bothered me was Joey King. 
Ah, oh, Joey King. Um, I don't, I don't know, Patricia. I don't think she can act. Like there was something about the way she delivered her lines where I'm just like, you are trying way too hard, <laughs> and this should actually be really easy. <laughs> so stop it. Like I feel like she gives off this, this. Um, she thinks like she has to try to be cute, and she is really cute and adorable, just naturally. She doesn't have to try. So I don't know why she felt like she had to to act out some of the scenes the way she did. And I'm like, you're you're trying way too hard um, because you're naturally this cute. So stop. <laughs> yeah, but you got to think about the story and what she's going through, too. Like the character herself is going through. There's an older guy that she's not supposed to be seeing who's her best friend's brother that they made a pact to not you know, date relatives or whatever. And brother was definitely, he was always in the shadow. Right. You know, trying to be a high schooler and figure all this stuff out and not hurt your best friend. I feel like it worked because she was trying to over exaggerate the fact that she was cute as the character because of the situation that her character was in. If that mm-hmm. makes sense. I, I think it makes sense for you could argue that for the scenes where she's trying to get her best friend not to realize what's really going on. Like th- those exaggerations make sense. But then there are those moments like early on in the film when she she acts like she's completely oblivious of the attraction <laughs> <laughs> or like and she's just. There, it, even just one on one with the best friend character, I was just like, "Why are you guys such dorks?" Like seriously. <laughs> well, know. think about and it. it was, wait, the one more thing, and I please do not argue against this though. Come on, would you seriously wear that short of a skirt, like going to high school, even if you had a uniform and nothing else would watch? Like, did you really, honestly, put on that skirt thinking nothing was going to happen? Well, you're talking to the person that never owned skirts or went to school in a skirt ever. So, no, I completely agree. That was the dumbest thing ever. Okay, as long as we can agree on the skirt, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> that really bothered me. I'm like, and nobody would do that in their right mind. Like, I really don't understand. And that just made her appear dumb to me. So I've spent the rest of the movie thinking about how dumb she was. <laughs> I'm so glad we're talking about this. I know. So great. Girly emotions. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I thought it was good for what it was. And it was it was definitely a surprise. Like, I thought it was going to be more like, stupid teenage movie like the Amanda Bynes what was that Sydney White or She's the Man like She's the Man is a classic thank you very yeah, much okay that is it, not a stupid movie hey I'm not dissing it and I didn't mean to say stupid I just mean it was more comical than an actual serious teen movie where this one took it as a more of a serious teen movie. There was a little bit of comedy, but it wasn't meant to be a comedy, whereas She's the Man was meant to be a comedy. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so, yeah. I, I think you bring up an interesting point because, I mean, we clearly disagree about this movie, but while you, you appreciate it for being that, for me, I, because I found it to be in that, like, stupid high schooler movie like the old Disney movies that we used to watch and I'm saying we because any teenage girl has watched a Disney movie I'm sorry it's just fact um quote unquote original Disney movie so it just reminded me like I seriously had this moment when I was watching it I'm like man if this is what high schoolers are watching today I really need to go back and rewatch some of those old Disney original movies just to see how dumb they were. <laughs> like, like, I know how popular this movie is because it's getting a sequel. 
So I kind of just what? feel like I've, it proves to me that I've outgrown these kind of movies, which makes me a little bit sad because I'm not young at heart like Patricia is, clearly. But <laughs> it just also makes me think about, like, how when you're that age and so much stuff is going on, do you really need something like Cloak and Dagger or do you just need a, a fun Friday night to watch a stupid movie where clearly the girl ends up with a guy. And it's as simple as that. No, I totally get what you're saying. Yeah. And that's why I watched the other one because I was in need of that. And I actually liked this one. Oh, I loved this one. This one was okay. So if I had to pick between the two of which one to watch again, it would be set it up. Yeah. What the movie is called, put in quotation marks or whatever, title it. Um, so good. And I love the fact that, okay, so just a comment in general about Netflix and their movies and their original stuff that they're putting out. I love how they have both upcoming, like, people that you've never heard of on TV or television or movies or anything like that. They have brand new faces, and then they mix it with, People that are great, like Lucy Liu and that other guy that plays the other boss, who I don't know his name. Hey, Diggs. Hey, Diggs. Hey, Diggs. Well, yeah. Anyway, (laughs) I love that Netflix does that sort of mashup thing to make those diehard fans of whoever they decide to add in that's like a veteran and then bring in some new fresh faces to give you something new. It's That's what I love about the Netflix. Netflix film. Yeah. No, I I really like this movie. It's um it's set with people in our generation, so in their twenties. So I think that's part of the reason why I appreciate it a little bit more because they're dealing with problems that that I deal with trying to grow up. And it, it really did make me feel old when um the guy character was criticized for being 28. So I, I think that's very <laughs> offensive. Um, yeah, sure. Sorry, I'm still trying to figure out my life. <laughs> so, and, and they both work for these, these people who are in their probably late forties, career oriented, very successful, but both of them feel like it's an interesting parallel between both the assistant who's still trying to get their life in order and the successful version of who they want to be. But they also acknowledge that they're, they're, they're missing something like them. Their mentors are missing something. And so you see them try to set it up and make their two mentors go out on these dates so that they can have all this free time to actually live a life and, you know, have some experiences and fall in love um, and really what just drew me to this movie and made me really surprised by it was how much I laughed at it. It got some really clever dialogue lines and it was some great banter. Like, Kissing Booth did not have this level of banter. And this is what I like in a romantic comedy. I like the two characters when they meet to criticize each other and it to be adorable. <laughs> Well, because that's totally realistic. Either that or, you know, like in my my case, I just make a complete fool of myself and everybody's laughing anyway. Um, <laughs> but you're right. The banter. And I love the friends. I, I love that the friends weren't the main focus of the story of the assistants, Charlie and Harper are the main mm-hmm. characters. I love that their friends were integrated. Like the Harper's friend is getting married and she has an engagement party to go to. Like that's totally something that like, I know I'm dealing with now. Like so many people are getting married and I'm like, cool. I don't know. Like I loved her comment when she first finds out, she's like, aren't we too young to be getting married? I know. Yeah. I, I was know. like, same. I, I'm There's- pretty sure I've said that in my life before. That are like, aren't we too young to be having kids? Like, yeah. seriously, guys? <laughs> so many moments when persons of our young adulting ages 
can relate to this movie. But it it's not and it's not done in a very cliche way either. Like some of it's a little bit cliche, but I feel like it's relatively like fresh or maybe I just haven't seen a movie that's about our generation lately and I I don't know. But I felt like it was a fresh take on the assistant to the executive like versus what I compare it to is sort of like the same interactions between the assistant and the executive of like the Devil Wears Prada movie with Anne Hathaway. A little Street. bit, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Devil Devil Wears Prada sets a high, high bar. Yeah, I yeah. mean that that movie is very intense. This one's less intense <laughs> on that front. <laughs> I, I want to I want to go back to your point about Netflix and what you really like about their original movies because this after watching both of these and starting to get more into Netflix Netflix original content um, it it reminds you that that because of what's going on right now with movies in general like the big budget movies is that and People are only going to see movies um, as long as they're not called solo. <laughs> if <laughs> which um, might I add, only made nine million dollars this Disney, weekend. Disney so. has already turned the page. <laughs> We're on the Incredibles now. <laughs> I know, but but see, it has to be event driven. We get a lot of sequels. We get a lot of franchise movies, big tentpole movies. We don't get movies that are like this anymore. And so I'm, I'm pleases me that Netflix is willing to step up and kind of bridge that void. Um, because there are, I, I've had plenty of weekends where I just want to watch a simple romantic comedy and not rewatch ones like I have time and time again, because I can only rewatch them so many times. So. I like that Netflix and Amazon are trying to use their streaming services to bridge that gap in content. Yeah, and I think that that's kind of where I was going with the fact that this movie was a fresh take on something that we can relate to so easily. Um, is that it's not the exact same story, but it is something that with a simpler, you know, it's not as complex. It's a, it's got a simpler storyline. It's easy to follow it's got humor in all the right places and it was a pleasant thing to watch yeah yep i totally agree with that and we would talk cobra kai but will refuses to watch hey. it so that's it I'm for a, us tonight. i'm gonna edit, I'm a edit that out <laughs> <laughs> what it references no yep and that's it for us tonight <laughs> okay <laughs> oh man no we'll try to talk cobra kai next week so on that note patricia thank you so much for joining us again can you please tell the listeners where they can find you they can find me at pr miller 20 and that's uh at symbol <laughs> P-R-M-I-L-L-E-R-2-0. And it's been wonderful to be here again. Thanks for letting me talk about my girly movies on Netflix. Sorry. Will, your turn. I can't stop loving. Oh, oh, go, I am, go. Uh, you can find me at Will M. Polk. That's W-I-L-L-M-P-O-L-K. And I enjoyed hearing you guys talk about your own. Oh, man, you forgot your at symbol on your Twitter oh, handle. Oh. Wait, so that's at. Yeah. Okay. See, I was um, so into it. Find... I just forgot that. So. <laughs> and you can find me on Twitter at symbol SJ Belmont, S-J-B-E-L-M-O-N-T. Please follow our crew on Twitter at symbol Cena Nerd. <laughs> Friend us on Facebook. <laughs> Follow us on Instagram, but most importantly, rate, subscribe, and comment on both iTunes and SoundCloud. And you can also find us on the iHeart Radio app. And you can also find us on the Google Play Play Music. Good night. Geek out. You're welcome. <laughs>